All right, this is Dr. Bustai, and we're going to cover mainly uh, traditional chemotherapeutic agents, specifically within the context of uh, their, mainly their dose-limiting toxicities, which is one of the things that most people not only need to know, but um, also are one of the most uh, um, frustrating things about these medications, especially for the patients who have to take them, as uh, so that sometimes they can lead to toxicities that are, make it very difficult uh, for them to use. That's true for other uh, chemotherapeutic agents as well, or anti-neoplastic agents. Um, and so we've developed a tool to try to help us to try to remember it, to also make learning fun, and to help us to integrate this information as we learn some of these drugs. In addition to that, we're going to cover also drug classes, maybe drug names, and where they mainly target. Because um, again, for a lot of board exams, those are the fundamental things that you need to know. So this is a fairly basic overview, but an important overview. So one of the tools that we developed was this uh, little character known as anti-neoplastic man, and it got its name because of obviously neoplasm being something that is not normal, um, cancer and particularly in the body. And so we try to uh, reflect the anatomical location, uh, which you'll see here in a second on this figure with the uh, letters that correspond to some of the drugs. And we'll try to point some of those out. Now I do need your leniency here. This is meant to be a little bit of fun, but if it helps to uh, burn some of this information into your brain or if you can remember an image and kind of re re remember a dose limiting toxicity associated with that organ system uh, that's the point uh, is to help you to get the right answers on uh, the test but also remember them because they are actually real in clinical practice now these this uh, character was developed by a number of individuals um, including myself but also some oncology clinical pharmacists uh, John Harrington um, uh, Jose Morillo and uh, Sachin Shah. Uh, again, good friends and clinicians um, who have expertise in oncology who contributed to the overall development of anti-neoplastic man. And I'll point to him as we go throughout the various um, uh, drugs. So let's start off with just kind of going through the drugs, mostly in some degree of alphabetical order by the generic name. There's really no rhyme or reason to the order of this on the slides. Um, and if you look in the first column over here, what you'll see is the part, the uh, part of the body, the anatomical correlation to it. And I'll refer back to that as we maneuver through the lecture. But it's, uh, again, to guide you a little bit. And then you see the drug name and then the traditional marketed brand name or common utilized term for its use. And then the main target in column number three with the last column really reflecting on the side effects. Uh, maybe a few pointers, but really what we're trying to focus on are those dose-limiting toxicities that are classic for questions on the board. So the first first drug in this group is fluorouracil, also known as 5-FU. Um, this drug is a pyrimidine analog, and pyrimidine is one of our nucleotides that make up the DNA, and it inhibits uh, thymidylate synthetase. Um, that's the enzyme that it's focused on, so it's obviously going to impact DNA um, and, and cellular replication. One of the greatest or one of the dose limiting toxicities is diarrhea. Um, also can cause fairly significant um, bone marrow suppression. So if you look over here on anti-neoplastic man, you'll see the um, right here in the GI tract 5 FU. So the reason it shows it in the GI tract is to, again, correspond to the abdomen and the intestines, but also to show that he's having diarrhea. So that's one of the dose-limiting toxicities of 5-FU. Uh, asparaginase, um, really uh, not a, you know, a lot of dose-limiting toxicities. One of the biggest problems with it um, is anaphylactoid kind of reactions or anaphylaxis, but it actually has a low risk for bone marrow toxicity. And so when you look over on the part of the body of the bone, we reflect the A to reflect those drugs that have a low uh, bone marrow suppression risk. And again, that's reflective of his bones where the femur would normally be. Um, and so to, again, correspond to the anatomical location. What about bleomycin and uh, busulfan? Well, bleomycin, um, it binds to the DNA and inhibits DNA synthesis. Um, one of the things that we see with it, similar to busulfan, is, and I apologize for that, is the risk of pulmonary fibrosis. Okay. Um, and so these patients end up developing shortness of breath. And so when you look in the lungs, we have the B's 
um, and that reflects different. If you think about the anatomical characteristics of the lungs, they have multiple lobes, and so we see that here with multiple looking lobes um, and the B's to reflect the drug name and that they cause a pulmonary fibrosis um, in those particular, in the use of those medications. Moving on to uh, cyclophosphamide, this is an um, uh, alkylating agent. Uh, unfortunately, it gets metabolized to a metabolite called acrolein that um, causes what is known as hemorrhagic cystitis, especially at larger doses. It is also known to cause bone marrow suppression like a lot of these medications can do. And so if you look here at antineoplastic man down here at the bladder, there's a letter C to correspond to the uh, cyclophosphamide um, uh, causing the hemorrhagic cystitis in the M that lines the inside of the bladder here is reflective of use of mesna to try to prevent the cyclophosphamide induced or associated hemorrhagic uh, cystitis. Um, Cytarabine is era C. Uh, this is a pyrimidine, again, another one of the types of nucleotides that incorporates itself into the DNA and basically inhibits DNA uh, replication. It is known to cause ocular toxicity and specifically keratitis conjunctivitis, as well as CNS toxicity involving the cerebellum. And when you look on antineoplastic man, you see here for the eyes, you see the era C, A with the C um, also. So that's focusing on the conjunctivitis keratitis. And then when you look up here on, on, his, on his head, almost like hair, um, again, trying to make a little bit of fun out of this, right? Um, whatever helps you stick in your mind is what the purpose is here. But uh, that's to suggest that there's something going on in the brain, the central nervous system, and specifically in this case, it's the cerebellar uh, toxicity with this particular medication. When you look at the last one down here, cisplatin, um, you'll see that it involves multiple organs, the ears, the head, the mouth, the kidneys. Uh, we use the letter CP for cisplatin. Um, it's also an alkylating agent like cyclophosphamide, causes ototoxicity, CNS toxicity, and then acute as well as delayed emesis. Um, as it relates to the kidney, it's nephrotoxic, which is one of the reasons why we give a lot of extra fluids if the patient can tolerate it or consider the use of amifostine um, in the pretreatment. Um, unfortunately, it's one of our high, more highly emetogenic uh, chemotherapeutic agents. And so again, when we look up here on anti-neoplastic man, the central nervous system toxicity. So we have the CP, um, you know, kind of reflecting his ears. Uh, but again, the central nervous system, since one of the cranial nerves goes to that area and it's reflective of his head, you can see the highly emetogenic component here as the fact that he's vomiting cisplatin, the CP coming out of his mouth. Um, and when you look at the kidneys as it relates to nephrotoxicity, anatomically we have two kidneys and they sit in that kind of area in the um, orientation of our body um, and have like a little bit of that shape. So that's again trying to mimic not only the anatomical organ itself but also the location as well as the dose limiting toxicity and you can see that um, listed there for you. Uh, moving on to our anthracyclines. Uh, these are drugs that inhibit topoisomerase, which is necessary as the DNA is making a copy of itself. It uncoils and sort of unravels itself, but in, at the part where it's unraveling needs to be uh, prevented from going under a supercoil, and topoisomerase kind of helps keep that um, double helix from kinking up. And so if you block that or inhibit that, the DNA strand basically breaks, and so the cell can no longer replicate. Um, so we have and doxorubicin, epirubicin, um, and uh, idorubicin. So these drugs are known to have a significant risk on the heart, cardiotoxicity, specifically cardiomyopathy, especially at higher doses. Um, those dose limiting levels are different for the different medications, um, but it is important to recognize. Uh, we also see that there's this is one of these drugs that if it gets outside of the blood vessel um, and there's extravasation of the drug into the tissue, uh, this can cause toxicity to the tissue itself. And so um, if we look over here, um, the D's, so if there's, there's four chambers in the heart, right? Uh, and so here's your heart, so there's the four letters that represent the anthracyclines that cause cardio uh, toxicity. And you can see that as it relates to extravasation, 
of uh, drug outside, it can cause irritation to the tissue, which is one of the reasons why a lot of these patients have pick lines, which is basically a, a central line that's placed so that they don't have to worry about not only access uh, from having to get stuck multiple times with an IV, but also preventing the risk of extravasation that can sometimes happen with these medications and the damage that they can do to the tissue. Uh, when you look at the next drug, we have dactinomycin. Uh, this is, again, one of those drugs with extravasation risk. And so if you just simply look at the IV bag, that's where that duct is on there. Um, and then um, uh, aerobilibin uh, basically works on the uh, tub microtubules. Uh, microtubules are necessary for mitosis. Um, if you think about mitosis, the cell having to pull those chromosomes that are apart, uh, pull them apart to make cop as they, after they've made copies to make two new cells, uh, the microtubules are necessary for that process. And so when you block them, uh, they no longer can work. And so one of the dosamine toxicities is peripheral uh, neuropathy. And so when you look at the hands and sort of feet, we have a little letter E over here to reflect his thumb. Um, so again, peripherally um, causing neuropathy. So all of these drugs up here, you'll see with all the different letters on the extremity cause a peripheral neuropathy, some worse than others. All right. Uh, Ixapbeplone is a, also an antimicrotubule agent, and as you can imagine, any drug that seems to affect the microtubules seems to have an effect on the nerves, and so one of the dose limiting toxicities of that is um, uh, the peripheral neuropathy as well. It's also one of these drugs that causes hypersensitivity reactions with the infusions because of some of the uh, uh, diluents that are present in the formulation. And so pre-medication with an antihistamines um, is sometimes important. And so when you look here, the letter I, again, reflects the periphery um, and the cause of peripheral neuropathy because of their effects on these, those microtubules. Uh, moving on to iphosphamide, it's an alkylating agent, um, and it causes also the metabolite to form uh, acrolein, and so it can contribute to uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, similar to the cyclophosphamide. And so just like our, the, we have a urethra that comes out from the bladder and releases the urine, um, we, again, try to anatomically de designate that. You can imagine that we had quite a number of laughs as we developed this tool. But, um, you know, again, uh, making learning fun, uh, that represents the urethra so that urine comes out, but it's also reflective of the hemorrhagic cystitis that occurs in the bladder. Um, and again, another reason for using mesna, simply sim similar to cyclophosphamide. Uh, the last drug on this um, list here is ironotecan, or also known as camptosar. It also blocks topo isomerase, so it's gonna affect cellular replication by preventing that um, DNA as it uncoils or, and, you know, uh, to create another copy, that supercoiling will be um, a f a f fixed, and so the strand will um, break. Uh, it unfortunately is associated with uh, severe, acute, and delayed um, diarrhea, as well as pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and then if you also look here in consideration of pharmacogenomics and genetic issues as it relates to practice, this is one of these drugs that we should do bedside testing on um, prior to the use of this drug because if patients have a genetic polymorphism to UGT1A1, um, 28, these patients cannot um, glucuronidate the SN38 metabolite that then can contribute to not only pulmonary fibrosis, but also worsening uh, bone marrow suppression. And, and so these things can go up. And so patients with that genetic polymorphism should not get this medication. Again, the um, I R, our rhinotecan, is part of the intestinal system. Yes, it's in the shape of the 5, or the 5-FU, because fluorouracil also causes a lot of um, diarrhea, but rhinotecan also contributes to that overall uh, diarrhea, which is represented here. All right, moving on to methotrexate. This is going to be reflective of the uh, liver as well as the mouth. The mouth because of the risk of mucositis. The liver because of liver fibrosis and toxicity. Um, this drug focuses on the enzyme dehydrofolate reductase, so it prevents the folate 
from getting converted to uh, dihydrofolate and then tetrahydrofolate, which is necessary in order to transfer the methyl group as you make pyrimidines and purines that are necessary for cellular replication. And so when you look on antineoplastic man, we have methotrexate affecting the liver, and then around the mouth, we get the mucositis that can kind of form around uh, around that area, especially at the higher doses used in, in chemotherapy. Um, Moving on to some of these other ones, we again, we have another drug, uh, mustard gen, which is known as uh, extravasation risk. And this, if it does do that and you're not using a PIC line or a central line, then this is where you need to inject sodium thiosulfate uh, er area in into the area and use a cold compress. Uh, when you look at oxaloplatin, uh, this is an alkylating agent causing oral pharyngeal paresthesias as well as peripheral neuropathy. Um, and when you look at this on, on our guy, so the periphery, we have our, his little joint here, which is the elbow uh, to reflect the periphery and then the, paris, the oral paresthesias that occur around the mouth. Uh, it's uh, reflective there, obviously, of his mouth while he's vomiting, unfortunately. Um, and then streptozosin is an alkylating agent um, that works for pancreatic cancer, and unfortunately, it can cause a insulin-dependent diabetes associated as well as uh, nausea vomiting, just like any other pancreatitis could. And so again, the pancreas sort of sits here over on the left upper quadrant and it sort of has a long tail. And so we mimic that with the S for the influence on the pancreas and its use for pancreatic cancer. Moving on to our taxanes. Again, they work on the microtubules. And as you can imagine, because they work on the microtubules, they're going to cause a peripheral neuropathy um, in, in these patients. So um, Pasotaxol, docetaxol being classic agents um, in here. And so again, when you uh, look at these taxanes, the letter T here, okay, down here, uh, they reflect those drugs that cause the peripheral neuropathy. All right, moving on to um, thalidomide, all right, and uh, linolidomide. Uh, this is an angiogenesis inhibitors. Basically, they are very teratogenic, and uh, the, the complication back in the uh, early days when it was used uh, as dysmelia, this basically, they have no arms, and uh, unfortunately, uh, their ex extremities are affected significantly, so it's very teratogenic. Unfortunately, it also causes uh, peripheral neuropathy, and so when you look at antineoplastic man, again, that's reflective of the T's for the taxanes as well as um, thalidomide specifically. All right. The vinca alkaloids also work on the microtubules. That's your vinblastine, vincristine. Again, so if you look at the arms, the legs, uh, but it also is associated with the extra visation risk, and if that happens, you inject hyaluronidase into the tissue uh, if that should happen. Um, so let's look here, sorry. If you look here, these are the V's for the vinca alkaloids and the vinblastine, vincristine. You see here, again, to reflect the peripheral neuropathy. Again, the V up here in the bag because of the risk of uh, extravasation, which can be um, problematic and need to have the injections of the um, hyaluronidase in there. Um, Velcade, uh, the reason it's uh, the V here is used first, um, it's a proteasome inhibitor, causes also peripheral neuropathy and extravasation. Uh, and so again, the uh, listing up here is in the V here for the Velcade that we or change the order of the, the, the brand versus the generic there, uh, simply to drive home again, a reminder of these drugs that are associated with some of these. So it's important to recognize that you should know the, you know, not only the brand name, generic names, but then recognize the target or drug class um, that because it helps to identify how it kind of works. And then two, it also corresponds to a little bit of some of the side effects. And so, uh, like I said, like, for example, those drugs that affect the microtubules tend to have more peripheral neuropathy. So it's important to know these dose limiting rate, uh, toxicities uh, for your boards, as well as some of these targets that we've just discussed.